Okay, um, welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming out. We, um, we're just so gratified to have such a, a group. I, we did plan this yesterday, um, <laughs> but we thought it was important uh, to do something around these attacks quickly and to kind of help sustain the conversation here on campus. Um, my name is Laurent Dubois. I'm the director here of the Forum for Scholars and Publics. I'm going to do the, the usual thing, which is to send around our sign-up sheet. If you're not on our list, we don't send out too many emails. About every two weeks, a newsletter of our events and other events on campus that deal with <coughs> scholarship and engagement. So um, you can sign up there if you'd like to get those. Um, I'm really um, so grateful to Nagar Motahedek, who um, agreed to do this again yesterday via text um, to, to kind of come here and, and participate in this. Um, our thought was really that there are obviously so many things involved in thinking about these attacks in terms of geopolitics and, and all kinds of other questions, many of which we won't be able to grapple with today, um, and we don't have the expertise to grapple with. But what we could talk about was the way in which it's social media and the kind of experience of these events um, is being shaped by social media today. Um, and the way in which kind of that shapes the, the direct experience in the cities that were attacked in Beirut and Paris and other places. Um, the experience in which we kind of have a, a kind of immediate relationship to it and a kind of, kind of sense of the desire for solidarity, maybe ways of expressing solidarity. Um, and all of these features of this kind of experience. Um, and so it's, again, it's, it's, it's something that if you haven't read uh, Nagar's book, which is called Iran Election, it's a short uh, book, not just about the Iran um, movements and social media, but really about the history of social media um, and Twitter and especially, but other forms as well. Um, so I have been reading this book. I was reading this book just as I was as these these things were happening. So again, thank you for for, for being here. That's um, awesome. I I wanted to start by just asking you if you could help us think through. Um, in this book, you're really talking about the way in which social media kind of helped you know navigated and helped sustain a kind of a, a multitude of activity during the Iran protests. Um, and I think there are parallels to how we experience you know, kind of these, these kind of attacks or events, although they're also different than a social movement. But I wondered if you could just help us reflect on, you know, what what happens, um, what is what is the experience of this today because of social media that might be different? Well, I mean, the, one of the things that I, I write about in, in the book on Iran election is how um, the protest movement that emerged after the fraudulent elections in Iran in 2009, was uh, took on a meme-like character, where where it went from um, from the ground onto social media and back onto the ground as as meme. So what happened essentially was that um, a reformist leader challenged the sitting president uh, president at the time, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And the color that he and uh, his voters adopted was the color green, which was the color of uh, the Shia imams. And so when uh, the votes were not counted, uh, people showed up on the streets in the color of the reformist party, the color green. And um, so uh, Twitter essentially uh, joined the movement online by uh, putting a green overlay. Uh, Twitter subscribers at the time put a green overlay on their accounts, and this is a collection of all of the, of many of the, of the um, avatars that were greened at the time. Um, and this memeing actually, I am very sorry. Oops. This is not happening. Um, so this, this memeing actually, uh, uh, after, after the, um, the killing of an innocent bystander at Miwan, this memeing took on a life of its own where images of Neda, the, the first so-called martyr of the Iranian post-election crisis, um, her image was taken all over the world and people put on masks and essentially turned every city, Paris included, into Tehran. Um, because, uh, also because of the, I guess, because of the black backlash by the government and because of the spying by the government on people who were tweeting, 
um, messages about uh, the next uh, gatherings, uh, the next um, protests on the ground were printed on circulate, circulating media such as um, money, uh, on buses, and on walls. And all of this was done with the color of the reform team that they had. So the color green was green. And I, I see this, so the prayer rugs, um, the skies were green, and so forth. So this kind of, <coughs> this kind of naming uh, showed up also during Charlie Hebdo, mm -hmm. where the pencil became the, the symbol of the, um, of the protest against what happened um, to the, uh, to the public, to the journalists um, who ran the publication, Charlie Hebdo. And, um, and this also took a character that was both online and offline. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite of the two. So a very similar thing has happened also um, during the protests in, in or I get actually the, the uh, not the protests, but the responses to what happened, uh, mm -hmm. especially in Paris. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think, I mean, what's, what happened in the Iran case was this, I mean, it, what, it, what in some ways social media allowed was for people to feel, to be involved, right, in some ways, and, and um, the, the quality of the response to the Paris attacks, right, which you have some images of, too, of, of the, the, that ability to kind of make your avatar, right, the French flag or pray for Paris, and then um, the kind of reaction here. But the, the, the interplay between that on social media and then it, it's embodied in spaces, right? So it's not as if the social media is just an abstract space. It kind of affects how people live in, in the spaces themselves. Um, one of the things that I wrote about uh, this weekend about the attacks was that this, this, there's a kind of curiosity around the attacks on the stadium in particular, the Stade de France, um, which as those of you who follow it saw, I mean, you can call it that. Um, so one of the things about social media, right, is that the way in which you find out things are going on is particularly peculiar. Um, and I found out about it because I tweet a lot about soccer and sport. This was the same sort of image that I first saw. Um, maybe can you just play that line? Um, so this came across the screen, and what that is, is there was a game going on, of course, the France-Germany friendly, um, and the, a bomb exploded. This was the second explosion, actually. Um, and it kind of briefly paused the game, as you saw, but then the game continued, right? And one of the reasons for that is that in, in a stadium, people can't get cell phone service because there's so many people trying to get cell phone service, right? There's, everyone's trying to... So, so interestingly enough, this entire game went on. For, for, for a long time after the attacks began, even outside of the stadium. The, the coaches knew what had happened at halftime but didn't tell the players. Um, and so you had this kind of group of 65,000 people who were literally being besieged in a set, right? There were bombers who, were try, who had tried to get into the stadium but had been stopped, and then bombs that went out outside, um, who were kind of outside of this experience, but the center of the experience at the same time. Um, and then one of the, again, those of you who've read about the case know that at least so one of the players who played this entire game, his cousin had been killed in the attacks. He found out afterwards, this is La Sana Diara. Um, himself, who's a Muslim, um, who's from of Mali, Mali background, who at some point earlier this year, there had been a rumor that he had actually joined ISIL, like that there had been this kind of scurrilous rumors about him because he's a prominent Muslim player. So you have this kind of very strange experience, right, where these things kind of intersected in this attack as well. Um, so, and so that only at the end of this game did those people in that space kind of come to experience what was going on uh, elsewhere in the city, right? Um, and then in a sense, the, the, the fact that the, the attacks on the stadium didn't happen the way they were supposed to according to the, the attackers and that they weren't able to get in um, <coughs> while the attacks elsewhere went much further. Um, so, one of the things we were talking about before uh, starting today was, was that the, you know, the green overlay didn't just uh, show up on prominent um, sites around the world. Um, the Empire State Building, Christone, so, um, Azadi Square in that's, Iran. But, that's Iran, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Azadi Square in Iran. Um, and, uh, uh, but also um, on hockey fields in, in Boston, in Sweden, and all over the world. Right. And I was asking you what you make of that kind mm -hmm. of me. 
<coughs> right, right. That mirrors this kind of need. Mm -hmm. exactly. Right, right, right. right. On, on Facebook. Yeah, so I do think, I mean, again, it is, you know, not to focus only on the stadium, but this, the fact that the attack revolved around the stadium. Um, it also, of course, in the French context, the French soccer team has been a kind of counter symbol to the more right wing visions of France in the sense that it's always been a very diverse team. Um, it's the place where France won its World Cup, where Zinedine Zidane, um, you know, had won the World Cup for France. He's the son of Algerian immigrants. So, but also a place where there had been a, a, a pitch invasion at one point by Algerian fans during a France-Algeria game. So it's this place that's always been saturated with a lot of the, the debate about France <coughs> um, and its identity. But I also think that this kind, so that the, the reaction among uh, for teams to kind of overlay the French flag. Um, you know, all of which is interesting, right? The French, I mean, the French are not always popular in the United States, as we know. Um, so this kind of embracing of the symbol of France. Um, and I did want to ask you what I think immediately then emerged on, on, on social media quickly, which was why Paris was evoked all this way when Beirut wasn't, right? So the kind of different, the different reasons for which events register or become the site of solidarity. Um, I mean, Beirut and Paris themselves are two cities that are pretty interlinked. and. Um, but that kind of sense of why why a certain attack right in a world in which there are constantly these kinds of violent events becomes feels so personal right in Iran. In the same way, you could ask about the Iran crisis. Like, why did there are lots of democratic movements throughout the world, but for some reason, many of us felt tied to the Iran way. And, and so I wonder if you have thoughts about why and how that happens. I know it's a tough question, <laughs> and we can. You know, I mean, and social media is, uh, uh, you know, I see, I see these overlays as a way to celebrate, you know, love wins, love is love, and, and to mourn. So this is a form of grieving, a collective grieving online, and I think it's a very useful, you know, social media is a very useful tool to bring together a collectivity like that. But, uh, you know, the complaint, uh, the complaint this time is why were there, for example, um, safety check-ins for Paris and not for Beirut. And uh, Zuckerberg has an answer to this, which is that they decided precisely the day of the Paris attacks that they were going to change um, change the, che the check-ins, uh, which were specifically for nat natural disasters, so for um, the earthquakes in Pakistan and Chile and so forth to also human disasters, such, mm -hmm. such as the attacks. That hadn't happened at the time the Beirut attacks had taken place. So I mean, these, these things that social media do are, are very useful. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my sense also that the prominence of Paris versus Beirut is, is sort of uh, the media and social media's um, attachment to clicks and shares, like how many how many likes does does a story get, or how many likes does my post get, versus an, um, another. And uh, what what is obvious is a lot of a lot of our friends um, uh, have spent time in Paris, you know, have and they immediately did things like this. This is me in Paris with bad hair three years ago, or uh, this is me next to the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there is a lot of that, mm -hmm. a lot about what what is clickable, what is shareable, what, mm -hmm. what pays off in the media environment. Right. And there was in this case, because again, and there was a, piece, a few pieces that pointed this out, that the attacks, I mean the part of Paris that was attacked, um, the sites that were attacked are very familiar for a certain kind of youth, youthful Paris, right? A kind of certain, I mean, you can see that there's a kind of correlation. The, 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 the club that was attacked, a place, kind of a landmark for people who listen to music in Paris. And so these were, they did feel like, again, for, I think, a certain community, um, very familiar sites. You know, like, even if you've only been there a few times, it felt like you could have been there. Right? Um, but I also, of course, that's presumably true for Beirut, too, and other communities, right? So, I mean, is it just that there's just a different social media? Or is it that if we were looking at a different social media, we would see something different? You know, that's why I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Those of us who had friends friends who've grown up in Beirut got, mm -hmm. got those posts. Right, and, right. You right. know, um, and that is, that is part of the algorithm mm -hmm. of social mm -hmm. media. Right. Part of the question, we're going to talk just for a little while longer, and then we'll open it up for discussion because I want to have a conversation. But um, 
part of the question, I guess, to me, and then I see in your book, and I can see here, is right. It's the interplay between sharing and action, which for critics of social media feel like it's sort of an empty, right? It's very easy to, to green your avatar, right? The question is, does this turn, does this make actual change later? Um, but I, I think in, in your work you show that there's a sort of really an interplay between action and, and media in all these interesting ways. I mean, not necessarily in all cases. But I think as the kind of, as an event like this happens, right, and you can see this just even today, the way in which you know, how is Twitter reacting to the governors, you know, saying they don't want Syrian refugees? Um, and at least on my timeline, maybe I have a lot of historians, it's essentially comparisons to the 1939, you know, refusal of letting Jewish refugees in. And so there are people, people are able to make analogies that are to, as a form of critique of these kinds of actions. Um, and I think, you know, so that's interesting too, and that's one of the things you very quickly saw in the Paris attacks is that everyone very quickly, there's a sense of, well, how is this going to be used politically? How is the far right in Paris going to use it? How can we counter that, right? So the, the war over the interpretation of these events starts to happen very quickly, which is, I think, one feature of social, social media, that the event is followed upon, you know, literally instants, instants, instants later um, by the question of how the narrative is going to be framed, right? And are they going to frame it a certain way or another? I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Well, you know, I think that social media obviously is a, is an amazing place for uh, quickly um, transferring, transmitting information. That's just a good one. I am a, a, a big, uh, you know, I, I'm big into thinking about social media um, as a as a whole new ecology, right? and we're building this ecology together. And what I see is not that social media is effective in activism necessarily, and hence the, hence the idea of slacktivism or clicktivism, mm -hmm. but, but that it is effective in transforming, so these kinds of actions, changing your avatar, um, posting about attacks and so forth, these are effective in transforming this new ecology and shaping it in the way that we, we want it to, to be. We want social media to be a place where, uh, for example, uh, we know we can check in and see that our friends are safe. That's an amazing tool. We, can, we use social media as a way to come together and um, work out issues. That's, that's amazing. I don't think any of the social uh, revolutions or revolts um, have actually been um, generated by Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. counter to what media outlets keep telling us, you know, right. that the Egyptian revolution, Tunisia, whatever, was an effect of a Facebook revolution, or that the Iranian um, uprising was an effect of a Twitter revolution. What the the trend the 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 trending hashtag Iran election it trended for a whole year on Twitter, nonstop. What that what the um, what the solidarity and collectivism around this hashtag did was transform the entire environment of Twitter. Mm -hmm. It shaped it, it it forced Twitter to um, to hyperlink hashtags. So that one would know that the conversation that I'm having here is linked to the conversation I'm, <coughs> someone is having over there. That this image belongs to that. That was a great thing, and that's that's really transferred over to Facebook and Instagram. So we know how how these things are grouped and uh, grouped together. Um, and that's I mean that's one of the things I learned in this was just that. I mean, the, the, the reality is that Twitter changed because of the social movement, right? I mean, it's the, yes. and that only happened because of the Iranian movement on the streets, right? And then it kind of forced, right? But they, they caught up with that in a certain way. Google and, then, and Facebook yeah. changed too. Yeah. They, they actually added translations. Mm -hmm. You know, Iranian Persian language translations only days after the revolt, precisely because they wanted people around the world to be able to speak to each other and, and you know, English speakers and French speakers to read Persian mm -hmm. um, tweets that were coming out. It was a huge transformation of the ecology, and I, that's what, how I see so-called collectivism working. It's a transformation of this ecology um, mm -hmm. to, to, for human ends. Right. 
And you're saying, like, so even this change about the safety check, and that's a recent change yes. in the well, right? So this event will have changed how people use social media exactly. in a way. We yeah. wanted not only check-ins for natural disasters, we also wanted them for human disasters, mm -hmm. and there it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's particularly around these sorts of events because from people I know who were you know, in Paris at the time, at, like the stadium I described, it's also like around the attack. So people who were traumatized in the attacks, for instance, or who, you know, who survived but couldn't remember who they were, and there's these people who are sort of out, who couldn't be found for quite a while, which in a sense is so jarring in our world where we feel like everything is accounted for, right? So, and that was something I think you could see through social media is that the fact of not knowing where someone is all the time which we're used, you know, you basically, we've gotten to a place where, through Facebook or elsewhere, you have a sense of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the way that, that this event kind of upended that, and then social media has to kind of respond to that, was kind of moving. You can kind of see that happening over the course of Friday night into Saturday. Um, there's partly a way in which the very, so that the very specific thing, like I'm looking for this person, becomes a kind of meme on Twitter, although obviously we over here can't do anything about it, but right, but at least I felt like, you know, you would retweet and things like that, mm -hmm. just on the hope that perhaps it would help when, when people are showing, you know, clicking photographs of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so. What do you make so. of this uh, grief shaming that's going on? Tell me more about that. So, grief, so grief shaming, you, this morning, you all know about grief shaming, right? There is. There is this, um, oh, I, I actually um, uh, grabbed some tweets before I came here. So the Pray for Paris campaign is such a racist thing. Why not pray for Beirut as well? They were also attacked. Oh, wait, uh, they aren't white. So that, that's the kind of grief shaming. Or, you know, um, what happens in Paris happens by Hezbollah in, in Israel all the time. That kind of grief shaming. So. Uh, or I see you're upset about blank, but you should really be more upset about blank. So that that has uh, has really become um, during these attacks, these right. two attacks especially. I've seen that happening a lot on Twitter mm -hmm. and, and Facebook. Yeah. Thoughts about that? Please? Yeah, maybe we can begin opening it up actually for people to. Um, I mean, I'll just sort of say on that this kind of, this jarring sense of what if the ethics. I felt this the other night, right? Sort of when there's a disaster going on. What are the ethics of tweeting, right? For I, for instance, felt sort of upset that I was getting random tweets about things that weren't having to do with this. You're in the you know there was a soccer game, but I sort people are tweeting, and I'm like, what world are you in? But then of course you realize people aren't in the same world necessarily, and that kind of and this is the same sort of thing, right? Where I mean, I think it probably took about five minutes between the first tweets coming in about the disaster and then tweets coming in about saying this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, the rapidity with which this happens is very, I, like, so I actually, it was, it was rare for me that I was not able to be on Twitter on Friday night because this, you, you see what I mean? Yes. Um, it's so, yeah. so I do think there's something about that experience, but I think at the root of it is, right, there's a desire to somehow connect to, to sort of mourn, as you said, you know, to, to feel some connectedness in mourning, for instance, through it. And, you know, whether, the, whether social media delivers that or doesn't at different times, I think, is... So it's interesting that you bring this up, right? That people are telling each other they shouldn't be feeling something, <laughs> right? For reasons that, again, I mean, another version of this that came out, which is when the media quickly said, you know, wor the worst violence in Paris since World War II was the quick, um, which turns out isn't really true, at least in terms of body counts, because in 1961, several hundred Algerians were killed by the police during a nonviolent demonstration. So people bring that, right? So then, with those, so, so the politics of memory come into this. Um, and you can kind of see that battle. I mean, I think that's a more substantive question mm -hmm. because think, you know, what's forgotten and what's remembered in French history. Mm -hmm. um, so. But maybe, I think we've maybe talked enough and we wanted to have this to be an opportunity for people to also just share comments, questions, any new form response. Yeah? Yeah, I think it's, um, now that you put it, this with your first comments on social media that you were getting comments about, maybe we're just within the social networks that one is within. Uh, that kind of made me rethink my perspective because, you know, waking up, actually just waking up this morning, I was thinking, well, of course, this tweet makes perfect sense, and although I probably wouldn't tweet this uh, because it's not my positionality to do so, um, I have no right to do so one way or the other, I can I'm not going to argue with the person that tweets this. 
And now that you say what you do, I'm kind of like, well, they're still not wrong. They're still making a point and a valid point. But is it a little far-fetched to expect that everyone, that everyone would, if you have that connection to Paris or you've traveled to Paris before, why wouldn't you do a sort of a grief thing, uh, a grief, um, what was it, cover, fake covering? Shaming? No, oh, like how about, uh, an overlay. An overlay, overlay right? right? Yeah, solidarity. Yeah, like for example, I actually didn't do an overlay. My father is gay, but when the decision came down with the Supreme Court, I didn't do a rainbow overlay. I just don't. I'm not into overlays, but I can see why people do it. <laughs> and so I, d I'm kind of seeing it as more complex. But what I do think is good about a tweet like this is although there may be different reasons uh, with social media and logarithms and depending on who your, who your friend network is, they'll feed you certain news, which I think is problematic in and of itself, but that's a different discussion. I think the way the mainstream media has treated, the t or not treated, the situations in Beirut or Paris mm -hmm. is a big problem. Right. Because... Um, I think that goes to your larger question, what is remembered mm -hmm. and what is forgotten? Mm -hmm. And the mainstream media, which shouldn't go by just pure logarithms, should be reporting a diversity of stories, always forgets of Palestinian lives, Lebanese lives, you know, two soldiers are captured in Israel, and not to say that that isn't problem, uh, that capturing two soldiers isn't problematic. But two soldiers are captured in Israel, and it's all over the world news, or, or a school shooting here, and all the international papers, the ones I read in Latin America, whatever happens in the United States, no matter how small, is suddenly blasted around the world, and Be in Beirut, no coverage. So I think a tweet like this is better directed less at the s algorithms of social media, which you know, you're going to expect people to mourn their specific social networks, and it is more diverse and complicated. Mm -hmm. But the kind of tweet like this is perfect for directing at the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. but, but also, I mean, I, I want to say that in this ecology, um, the mainstream media is just as susceptible to clicks and shares as the rest of us. They also want, want clicks and shares. And what is what story is more shareable, more clickable? Than, than the story which attracts, it, at least in the United States, the masses of people who once visited and had an amazing romantic visit in Paris versus there. Mm -hmm. okay. So you like you posed this question earlier, like why like why the reaction to Paris, you know, as opposed to Beirut, and you were kind of talking about, you know, it be, you know it's like selective media posting or whatever. I think it's also like. You know, you know, the media, Western media gets a lot of criticism for focusing on what has the best shock value. And I think because, like, Lebanon for the last three decades has been the site of conflict, like perpetual conflict, either between, you know, the, like, Lebanese, you know, Lebanese forces in Israel or Hezbollah and, and in Israel, and it has been this, like, site where, you know, these things, while tragic, are, are not as shocking, I think, to the, to the media. I think that's why, you know, one of the <coughs> large reasons why Paris got, you know, a bigger response because it was like Paris is not, you know, it, you know, excluding the 1961 Algerian protests that would, you know, that went badly wrong, has not been a site of conflict since World War II, mm -hmm. and so I think that was one of the reasons why you get uh, such a big response. But what's, what I find really interesting about this talk is we're focusing on this one side of social media: the Green Revolution, the, um, you know, the tweets, the uh, solidarity for Paris and the calling for more recognition of the tragedy in um, Beirut. But what's really interesting is Daesh, Daesh actually tweets 10,000 tweets a day. Mm -hmm. And they have this huge network of uh, news. So if you if you actually look on some of the Daesh Twitter sites, there was a lot of coverage for them about what happened in Beirut because they were, you know, proudly claiming um, the attacks. And, um, and I just find it interesting that like we're we're talking about how we're showing grief and solidarity and forming these imagined communities of, of you know across continents against Daesh, but at the same time Daesh has one of the strongest Twitter networks, like of all Twitter users. I mean obviously there's not like a Daesh account you can look up. Um, I've, I've tried and I've gotten an email from Twitter that was like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they you know they have this like wide network and they're actually you know we're trying to use that to 
find these operatives in these mm -hmm. cells, but it's really interesting that at the same time that we're showing grief for something they did, that they're, they're using the exact same form of media to combat it. And you even see that a little bit in Iran with the Green Revolution, when they, um, you know, at the same time that the Green Revolution was happening, Iran was trying to censor its internet and bring everybody back under its, like, heels, like, oh no, don't tweet that, like, let's, let's talk about other things, and they were trying to control the, the news sources domestically so that people would stop tweeting outward. And since then, there, there's been a huge increase in, you know, Ron trying to create this technological envelope to stop anything like the Green Revolution from ever happening again. <coughs> so it's just interesting that there's two sides of this social media function, and, you know, we focus on the one that, like, we all relate to because we all showed solidarity or we are showing in our own ways, however, I mean, I didn't put a flag up either, but, um, but it's interesting that it's, they can also be used for great evil. Did you want to say anything to that? Or just that, that just, just was going to confirm the, the myth of the liberatory function of technology. I mean, right. all it is, it is an ecology in which both, uh, that aids both good and um, evil. And um, both the ability to bring people together and, um, and the ability to survey people is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm wondering, I don't know if it would be presumptuous to suggest that this issue of grief shaming only makes full sense if put in conversation with the issue of the Syrian refugee crisis and the Western reaction to it. That, I mean, grief shaming in part, of, mind you, just as preface, I've, over the past couple of days, I've translated a lot of statements made by Daesh, and they've been very forthcoming about... Um, um, being encouraged by this Western reaction by several, I don't know how many uh, governors have made the case that we can't allow Syrian refugees because they are trying to establish this narrative that Muslims will not be welcome in the land of the cross. So grief shaming in part makes very little sense outside of the context of a reminder that the overwhelming majority of victims of Daesh violence are Muslims in Lebanon who were by and large ignored by social media in contradistinction to non-Muslim Parisians. So, I mean, would it be fair or presumptuous to suggest that grief shaming really doesn't make sense outside of the context of that conversation about the, the global Syrian refugee crisis and the Western reaction to it? Do you mind if I just keep taking comments? Or? Great. There are a couple of other hands, I think. Yes. One thing that troubles me is the number of characters, letters, and is there a difference between a message <coughs> that calls one's attention to a disaster that's happening and the ability to explore, explain, and debate what is happening? And is the overwhelming seduction of playing with our toys, and everybody plays with the toys uh, across the world, powerful enough to say, oh, I got this tweet, I know what's going on, as opposed to, I got this tweet in an Instagram, and I really don't know anything about anything, because it's contextless. And instead of creating a coherent narrative, you get fragments. And maybe if you know a lot about the context yourself, you can weave together fragments that explicate and explore. Otherwise, there's sort of a, a falseness in saying that people are being connected because they're tweeting to each other. Because what's being counted is the likes and the tweets, not necessarily any analytical depth that can happen in 148 characters. Yeah, I do. Th I mean, one of the things again in this work that you really see is that the that of course tweets often are just links to something else, right? So what the question is, what do they link to? <coughs> if they go on this level, it's a different thing. But in Megar's book, for, for instance, frequently you know connections to a YouTube video of a poem being read that itself is layered with all kinds of meanings or right so there's also there's lots of different ways to use the ecology I think and one is maybe very surface and others is that assumes ridiculous. that after you get the tweet the you tweet on link, the link yeah. you're gonna take the time mm -hmm. to go and watch the YouTube right no absolutely to just retweeting it to somebody else you know sure yeah. 
but that's part of, you know, that's part of the culture, and it's part of the ecology we've created, and really I think that it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to go away. No, it's not. And so, so we might as well acclimate to it <coughs> and learn to do the things that that it necessitates. Click on it, see where you know the connections that the hashtags create. It's there to create linkages, not to not to fragment, but to bring tweets and and ideas and conversations together. To click on links, <coughs> to go where these links take you, and you know to act responsibly with what you do retweet. Um, knowing that, that you are, in fact, a transmitter mm -hmm. of information. You are the meme yourself. Unless you don't know what you're meaning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I kind of wanted to push back a little bit on this idea that somehow you can't get analysis out of, like, however many, I don't, I don't know, I don't tweet often, 148, however many characters. There's actually a lot of work being done in terms of... Um, semantics and sentiment analysis where you can actually kind of break down, not necessarily, I mean, maybe you can't get the full story or the entire, like, PDF document of what's happening, um, you know, because I know I do like our law and PDFs, um, but you can actually get a lot in one single tweet in terms of not just what the person's saying, but the tone in which they're saying it, and, you know, you, there's a lot of tweet, a lot of, you know, analyzing Twitter is not just who shares it and what links are shared, but also there's the geotagging component, so you can kind of infer not just from the tone or what is being said or the content, but also um, where the, where that tweet is coming from, and then you can kind of, uh, you know, not impose some kind of context, but kind of situate that tweet in a particular, like, location from which that context might be coming. Um, and I think the people who are, you know, obviously there's clicktivism, like you talked about earlier, but I think there's also a fairly like, active community that you can form in Twitter. And so I'd, I, 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 would, I would push back also on the assumption that just because there's an article, like don't assume that everyone's not going to click it because we're all like lazy and ADHD. I think, I think if you know, people care about these issues, these are like really shocking emotional things that I think have incited a lot of discourse and a lot of um, you know, like this, this huge community like in grief and pushing back against the Daesh. So I think there are people who will click the news link or who will delve further. And you know, obviously you have the people who won't. But I, I think it's silly to assume that everybody is just as you know short-minded as the people who don't understand the memes or the context of the tweets. Yeah, I want to maybe comment about the word um, grief shaming. I found the word shaming to be really interesting because it indicates the sort of like berating and top-down push that I don't think is indicated in the power dynamic that's actually happening. I have like hundreds of Palestinian friends on my, um, so I, I got I mean, flooded by messages from, I mean, or statuses from Palestinians who, I think there's like a, I think it's more of a demonstration of double grief. The one layer is their grief for Paris itself, and the other la layer is the realization that their grief doesn't really count. So it's not like a shaming for, a, I mean, I'm assuming like the larger Western community for not, um, for not doing enough. It's more kind of a recognition, realizing that their life doesn't matter as much. So it's not as, as, as much as a shaming as like a sad realization, like a heartbreaking thing. Um, I'd like to respond to your comment about <clears throat> the brevity of the tweet medium. And I think that it actually makes issues more accessible to the general public because if everything was just a long, comprehensive analysis, I don't think that many people would be informed about it. So I just wanted to add on to your comment. I thought that's totally true. Although there is definitely like some grief shaming happening, I do think that a lot of what is happening is this like kind of realization of sadness. Um, I think that like totally, um, also the grief shaming, I think it comes out of a place of anger of a lot of people who I have to say like, I am Lebanese and I went to a French high school. So my newsfeed was just on two crazy spectrums of like, wow, I had all my Lebanese friends with all this one opinion and then all my French friends sharing this French imagery that was all over the place. And it was just really interesting. And I think that, yeah, it definitely it comes from, the, I think that most people are sad, but then that the shaming comes from anger. Like, why can't I change my profile picture to a multi-flag uh, uh, 
profile picture. Like, why can't I do that? Also, mm -hmm. why, when I open my Uber, is there a French little Uber going around my Uber? Like, <laughs> why is there no multi flat Uber? When I open my Spotify account, that I'm on my Spotify account, I listen to music like five hours a day. All my playlists have a French overlay. And I'm like, yeah, like, definitely, this is horrible, but, but like, where are, you know, and I think that the grief shaming comes out of a place of anger, like, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I definitely, kind of, I feel for this anger, because I feel the same way, like, you know, there's French flags everywhere, and, and it, Eiffel Towers everywhere, and it's in every single form of app that I use every day, has this French overlay, and then people are upset, it's like, I, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. I, not that I, I think grief shaming is problematic, like totally, but I think it comes out of a place of anger, like that people are, are sad and angry. Mm -hmm. So my comment is like, do you think the word grief shaming is a correct word to use or not? Isn't it a sign of a very, very difficult question that we have to look into ourselves and say, Am I a racist or not? Sometimes people don't think they're racist, but that's what they are. Maybe that's why we don't like it. We, everyone has the right to grieve for any human being. Everyone is grieving from Paris. But I think it's not like you're grieving for that, but you have to grieve for that. It's like, why are you not grieving for the others? If 129 or 200 lives lost causes France to go and you know, bomb the heck out of that Daesh mm -hmm. and destroys the trucks that is supplying their oil and they make money out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, where was that outrage when we know that up to today, mm -hmm. after two years, 100,000 Muslims have been beheaded, burned, raped by Daesh? So why didn't we destroy the supplies of oil a long <coughs> time ago? So I think it's not grief shaming. I changed my profile to France. I am very, very sad. But I grieve for them as much as I like grief for mm -hmm. the little children mm -hmm. who get beheaded because they're Shiites. Mm -hmm. So it's um, the, the ideology of Daesh is the ideology of hate and barbarism that is affecting everyone. Mm -hmm. So the point is not, not to grieve for France, but the, pain, the point is to grieve for everyone affected and as a community of the world to come together and say, well, this has to stop, and we have the power to stop. On the, on the issue of uh, racism, I also wanted to bring up this um, um, other thing that, uh, that trended alongside um, Paris. Um, this guy uh, has been in the gaming community, and he's been, um, he's been speaking up against the sexism in the gaming community for quite some time. Um, Birinder Jabal, he is a Sikh. And so the picture on your right is the picture that he took in the bathroom mirror. The picture on your left is the picture that was photoshopped where his iPad was turned into a Quran and he was put on, uh, they had photoshopped on a suicide vest. Mm -hmm. But this was done after the attacks, right? Is yes, this, this was this happened right after the attacks, and it it's uh, yes, it, it was as a result of what they say his, his tro trolling of uh, of the gaming community for their sex. So this was people who were angry at his um, critique of sexism in gaming. Exactly. Doing this in order to kind of troll him to, or, get, to or get to get back. What's, what's the person? Sexism in gaming and Islamophobia. I, I, I don't get the connection. Yeah. It's, a, that, it's, a red hair it's just a way to get get him in trouble because he is he's gotten the gaming community in trouble for its sexism. I mean, and who's the person? He's a he's a Sikh. He yes. He's a person who's criticized the sexism of the game, and so people who are. I guess right. defending the sex of the are doing I create this meme as a kind of but I mean it's a no it's a good point again because of the, all, the, all the different ways that this works, right? But it also shows the ignorance of the people who created it because he is obviously Sikh and they are making this assumption that he is 
Muslim and he's not. So and so it kind of I think there's this whole layer that all of a sudden shows how ignorant people are about the world religions and how they see a brown person and they assume he must be Muslim, he must be a terrorist. Yeah. And also, Qurans can't take selfies, but. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to think. I'm sorry, I don't know what your name is. Shara. Shara. Um, I, I think that's actually an excellent example of why perhaps grief shaming is a bit of a distracting way to label what's in fact happening because I think using that term prevents us from pushing a little bit further and understanding that uh, building on what Nagar was saying earlier about the, the mythology of what's created in, in a social media context, it produces a rupture between the world of social media and the real world in which we inhabit. And I know there's some people who would say the real world includes social media and you can't really separate them out, but what, it, what in effect ha ends up happening is that there is a utopic promise within social media of collectivity, of no boundary, of no nation, um, that is supposed to be united. And so when people don't find that because there are t tweets or things that are shared that, that in fact do follow the logic of boundaries and nations, et cetera, that we find in the real world, that seems like a violation of the promise of what social media is supposed to be. Um, and so rather than maybe thinking of it in terms of grief shaming and, and kind of along those lines, it maybe is actually a way to kind of show the tensions that are constantly existing in between those two spheres. Um, and the fact that what happens in one really does impact mm -hmm. the other. I mean, the obvious counter or the, the other thing to, we have to refer to, right, is the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. which is about making visible, which has been about mm -hmm. making visible deaths that were invisible, right? Or kind of, so to share and mourn around police killings um, that without social media might go unnoticed, at least at that level. So, which of course was already present with NIDA and Iran election as well, right? A kind of a death that would be unnoticed or that the, the state would want to not be noticed becomes highly noticed in a certain way. So um, I think that input play is, a, is, is constant. And of course, the option is for, for both to go on, right? Both a silencing and, a, and, and the opposite to happen. Yes. On my ride over here, I drove over with someone who works here. And we came up with, this isn't shocking or anything, but I just wanted to share it, that social media in this country is by and for white people and that's why you're not going to see it an overlay of a Lebanese flag you're not going to see an overlay of a Kenyan flag or any country flag where the majority of people are not white if they're brown or black you're not going to find an overlay or a tremendous amount of sharing of information if there are if there's any kind of a tragedy So, uh, my question, uh, you, Negar, you addressed this uh, in the beginning of your, your talk. Our daughter is in, in Paris, and my wife just texted me. Yes, she texted me too. She texted me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the question, you know the question. Uh, Please, go ahead. Uh, you have the question already? <laughs> yeah, Lily, daughter, yeah, our daughter Lily, immediately after the, the attack, she tagged herself on Facebook, yes, I'm safe. So apparently this is just, uh, uh, Facebook had just uh, instituted this policy or, you know, is this just coincidence? Or? It happened on the day of the, day the day Paris day. attacks, yes. So it wasn't there during, uh, on, it wasn't available for Beirut, but it was available. For but it's now just available to any Facebook user anywhere in the world. Yes. Right. Just sort of to, yeah. to or add. any natural or human disaster. Yeah. One more question. Is, 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 uh, one one uh, of your slides is very interesting. Uh, it was the uh, Azadi. Yes. Um, where? Yes. So, is this real or just a Photoshop? Or, uh, yeah. As far as I know, it's real. But <laughs> yeah, this is very interesting. Yeah. Of course, Iran has been also victim so somewhat uh, of, of the Irish and uh, ISIS. And the ISIS has repeatedly uh, threatened Iran to, you know, Khorasan, for instance, is next, or Tehran is next. And, um, but uh, it's, it's, to me, I'm, I'm very impressed to see this uh, as an Iranian. Um, apparently, they had these lights ready for it. <laughs> and and uh, blue and, and white. These Iran's 
um, overlay would have been, of course, you know, green, red, and I do think, I mean, I think that this question was, was well put, right? In the sense, it's a question of the grief, the grief of, of either being present or absent and, and of not having recognition for one's suffering and how that kind of plays out, I think, is part of it. So, so. I kind of wanted to ask a question. Um, so, like the, you know, Iran, uh, you just showed us the image of the, the bridge in Iran having the, the Paris pillars. You know, they've been, they've been united with, you know, Lebanon. Um, and like you know, uh, Lebanon and uh, Hezbollah and Iran have been fighting against Daesh since 2013. Why is it like? Why do you think they didn't post? You know, have the have the Lebanese flag colors in their bridge? Because would it, isn't that community more connected, like Iran and Lebanon, than say Iran and Paris? Uh, good question. What were we? What image were we seeing? It's the it's the Azadi Square, so the Freedom Square. Uh, it used to be called Shahiyad, a memorial to the king. Um, in Tehran. In Tehran, yeah. Um, you know, there's just so much graffiti uh, that, that um, is about the solidarity <coughs> between Iran and Gaza, Iran and Lebanon. Um, I, I don't see that, that, that this is, I mean, it's not necessarily extraordinary that it wasn't. Yeah, no, they probably, I mean, they might have just been riding the, the wave of Paris solidarity as well to show the world, like, you know, Iran's been trying to integrate into the international community a little more, so maybe by showing solidarity with this <coughs> Western nation, then maybe that was the thing. But, but I, would, I would just think, you know, that there would, have, there would have been some kind of, you know, Iran specifically responding to Lebanon and criticizing the rest of the world for not responding to Lebanon in the way that they responded to Paris. But... Yeah, I'm wondering if either of you could comment on uh, social media and its role in uh, fueling the current version of campus activism uh, from campus to campus. And do you see uh, that role as deepening? Um, I mean, certainly. I think that I just even before all this happened, right, the Miz, the, the Mizu <laughs> kind of situation with the the, the protests and the, and. There's clearly, I think, a relationship between social media, obviously the involvement of the football team there was important, and then the decisions on campus, right? So there's a kind of, for one thing, part of it is that the ecology of any place, I mean, whether it's the ecology of Paris or the ecology of campus, um, is, doesn't necessarily become globally visible, but there's always that latent possibility, right? That a, so that struggle on that campus, I think, in other eras, it, it could have connected with a broader national social movement and might have at other points but not quite in the same way. The, the, the rapidity with which we went from not even knowing, in my case, not even really knowing there was a movement at that campus, to knowing all the stuff about it, to having things to say about it, and feeling like I knew about it, right? With that, I think, is really interesting, right? And then, of course, it only works because there's also some sort of set of underlying issues that people recognize that are concerned about, so this becomes the example of a broader thing we're all concerned about that we're concerned about here as well. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I think then you have that within the United States, and then the question of how this works internationally, I think, becomes even more complex, right? Because what's, the, you know, on this basic question, what are we going to pay attention to at any given moment, mm -hmm. I think is the fundamental, which is a question of, it's a question of politics, of ethics, of just pleasure, attention, and emotion, right? So part, I do think that while getting information is very important in social media, some desire for mourning or for sharing joy. I mean, it, you know, these sorts of things, the emotional content of it is very important too. And I think when the, these are cases where those connect in a sense, right? There's a politics and an emotion to it. And that's when it gets very powerful. Yeah. And also social media has been used for enforcement of very important policies on campus, such as the Title IX, uh, that, that, is, uh, that, is the, that essentially forces universities uh, to investigate uh, a sexual harassment case or a rape, um, rape claim and to separate students and to accommodate the student who has is, who is made this claim immediately. So if the university doesn't act quickly, it will lose its Title IX funding. Um, around, around Title IX, um, there has been a lot of activism on campuses and it is through social media that that various groups of women have come together and, you know, um, and written up policy documents that then have, um, they have addressed to the universities. So I think 
uh, that is one of the most effective uses of social media that I've seen on campus and where um, policy issues have been taken up and mm -hmm. actually led to some, some change. It is interesting. I think we're seeing a phenomenon of both. Like, so campus institutions, politicians, and journalists are constantly running to catch up with what's happening ahead of them, right? In a way that I think is now this was this has been the case. This was the case in the French Revolution. It was the case in other moments in history. But the way in which that sort of sense of of not right, even even media in particular, right, feeling like the story is breaking ahead of you, and you need to catch up with it. And I think and politicians have that situation as well. Too. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I, I did. I think it's really interesting, these questions of kind of brief shaming and the overlays and the memes and their usage. I want to go back a minute to the question of these check-ins, which I think is just really interesting because it basically says, right, like, I'm okay, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. But the people I want to hear from right now are my sister who lives in a red state and wears the hijab because she's married to a Muslim man. And I want to know, like, how are you affected? Mm -hmm. You know, so in a sense, basically, you know, there's the question of like, am I safe? Have I been hit? But who else is unsafe right now? Right. And what do we need to know about that? And what do we need to be asking about that? Okay. Hi. So, um, kind of, I think related to what Marone was saying about um, grief and um, and the ethics around it. Um, I, I was thinking about you know um, the invocation of. Um, Kenya and, and the particular attack on the university that actually happened in April. Um, and so when I first saw it, I, I was kind of confused and I was like, I remember this, but maybe there's something else. But then there are like expressions of like fresh grief or like, oh, this too must be mourned. And it was, so on one hand, you kind of have this kind of uncomfortable, weird moment where it's like, does this just happen? Or some people right. thought it just happened um, because it was just circulating and people would be tweeting, reposting quickly. But at the same time, it's, it's sort of like I found myself thinking, well, that's not a bad thing <laughs> if somebody who didn't know about it before suddenly was called upon to have a reaction that they didn't, that, that you know, what, for whatever reason, they filtered out the, the moment that it actually happened. Right? So that kind of, I mean, the stilly version is sort of like Chinua Achebe is like dying every six months. Um, but, but maybe there is, you know, in terms of the kind of new ecology of emotions and sociality that, that's possible, maybe. That, I don't know what this adds up to, but it seems right. interesting. It does seem to me like with this event, it's, just, it's always a struggle over memory and mm -hmm. who's, right, whose story is told, whose story is not told. I mean, it's such a profound. But the fact, this is of course a constant part of any society, but the fact that it plays out in front of us and that we can be participants in a different way than, uh, you know, that might be the case with it's a question of monuments or right, other forms of them. Yeah. Um, with the check-in thing, I also what I noticed on the day of is that on my check-in feed there would be people who would check in as safe but weren't actually in Paris at the time. So that was also something that I found interesting. You know, why did people feel compelled to do something like that? Were they were there other people who just didn't know that they weren't in Paris at the time and they wanted to make sure, or did they want to feel a part of the movement? Or yeah. Here. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, it was mentioned earlier that um, you know there's a different context, and so since violence doesn't happen, you know, on land in the metropole very often, there's a different type of attention and paid to it. Uh, we study Haiti. Uh, mm -hmm. I particularly deal with Muslim slaves in the Haiti Revo Haitian Revolution, and sometimes how the Haitian Revolution was framed in what I consider to be Islamic terrorist terms. Um, I was wondering if you see any continuities between media contextualization of the Haitian Revolution in the 19th century and you know what's going on now. I mean, I do think there are there are like long term, and again, this is like I know I keep referring this book, but so. In this book, you see there's connections between certain sort of concepts that were used in the 1979 revolution and now. So I think there's a way in which things are new and they're also incredibly old and deep, right? So the, the way in which these things get framed, they were framed in, in, at other periods in time in a way in which the, the terms that are used is in some ways not that unstable. Um, so there are a lot of, a lot of comments. Um, so is there anybody who has a final comment? The last okay. It's great that we have social media that allows us to connect, it allows mm -hmm. us to see if loved ones are safe. Um, 
But is there any way we can use it to prevent these kinds of things? Mm -hmm. Is there any way we can use this information to stop these horrible things that we all grieve about before it happens? I know it seems far-fetched, but it seems like we have this wonderful, amazing tool. And is there any way we could make it so it could do even more than it's already done to change the world we all live in? Mm -hmm. Is there anything, is there any way we all can come together to make it a more powerful tool than it already is? And um, anybody can answer. I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah. Um, so I, I work for a lab on campus here that we do a lot with network analysis. And what I mentioned is geotagging of tweets and like looking through, like using Twitter and Facebook to like form these networks and things. In terms of like security, there is that aspect. But I think one of the things about social media that's an issue with like preventative measures, it's a very like in the moment or after it's past thing. You know, you can't really record something that's happening before it's happened. Um, so I think I think that's an issue, but in terms of and, and also especially like in the United States, you know, with the whole Edward Snowden thing, there was a huge there was a huge pushback from the American community about, you know, these are our rights, you can't just go into our private information to try to use it for security measures. So I think if you tried like I, I don't I don't know how else you would use social media unless you like somehow securitize it and I think you would see a huge pushback from that, especially from our, our nation who we like to put our rights um, <coughs> before our security, but in terms of, I think what can be done is like network analysis and tracking, you know, finding these Daesh cells or whatever, because obviously they're not they're not geotagging their headquarters, but they do have like cells all across the world. Like there's you know been cells caught in like Houston and Missouri and a couple other places based on finding who's you know who's tweeting for them or who's who's adding posts to their Facebook and things. So there's there's a way to do that, but in terms of like preventative. I'm not sure there's a way to... I mean, I, I have uh, been thinking a bit about um, if we do uh, think about the space as an ecology, as a space in which we actually live, then the space needs philosophers mm -hmm. rather than programmers, or in addition mm -hmm. to programmers, it needs theorists, it needs political thinkers. There, are need, there, are, there needs to be a system of government and a system of laws that really allow us to truly coexist in this space. And so I think that that, you know, um, that is something we can't really leave to happenstance. And so that's my my move. Thank you. When you say Thank system you. of government over like social media, are you talking about some kind of, you know, because I know there's been a lot of like um, movements by some like YouTube or other like groups to, to remove hateful comments on videos. You know how people like to troll like random articles about cooking and they'll just like go off on their opinions on gun rights down there. You know, movements to try to remove those comments. Is that what you mean in terms of censorship? Or do you mean kind of a more constructive way of community building that takes away these hateful messages out of Facebook? Because then, again, you kind of get into what the United States like likes to consider like the rights and personal freedoms if you're talking about like censoring, you know, what, um, Renee mentioned is this like you know, space, this ungoverned transnational, no boundary space that everybody can occupy in different ways. So, what exactly? Do you I don't mean, mean you censorship. Say? I actually well, yeah, mean the system of government. And we we need to we need to think imaginatively that as as an actual space. Like a like a city, or you know, as we think about cities or national space, um, families have rules. Groups online, even on uh, on the on the black uh, web, have rules, ethics uh, that they abide by, ethical rules that they abide by, and as long as we don't recognize this as a space in which we all we all inhabit, we're not we're not going to. Um, imaginatively think about how how we uh, how we should govern this space, how we should conduct ourselves in this space in relation to each other. I don't mean that. I don't yeah, mean that's 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 you know, there's been movements by, like, for example, the American military is trying to create a cyber command. You know, we have we have water, air, land, and now there's this whole new virtual space of cyber that just came out in the 90s, and of course the military is really slow on updating anything, but they're working on it, I've heard. And, um, you know, so there's, there's you know, there's move to do that as well, and I, and I think people are starting to begin, like you said, to treat this as a more tangible space in which like action can actually be realized than something as simple as like a tweet. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to? 
Yeah, I just I just want to kind of comment on what you've been saying a little bit and, and what you were saying, but I think one of the real challenges, and, and this goes back to also this, this notion of slacktivism and conflictivism, but one of the real challenges I think that um, social media faces is that it's extraordinarily effective at mobilizing, mm -hmm. but not so much at organizing. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this goes in some ways to your point about, you know, governance, you know, how do you, how do you get real action and sustained action, which requires organization, as opposed to simply the mobilization, which can be reactionary, right. but not preemptive. Right. Yeah. As yeah. Thank you. I do think, I mean, we'll probably stop at this point, but I think that, I do think that I was thinking in a more meta way about what you're saying, which is that to some, I mean, to the extent, this may be very romantic, but to the extent that social media can facilitate a kind of bigger conversation, right, about how, how one should shape our societies, you know, the, big, the, the larger conversation, the philosophical conversation, the ethical conversation, right, to think about these incidents as symptoms of larger problems. Um, then in that sense it can do something, right? And I think you could sort of see that around these attacks, like what I was referring to earlier, which is immediately the question will become, well, how, you know, how, how is the reaction going to happen, right? And people, I think, were very moved by sort of gestures in the streets of Paris that were, say, gestures of love and solidarity versus gestures of fear, right? Or gestures of connectedness or demonstrations, right? That um, even in the face of this, the, the, the reaction doesn't have to look like the attack, right? I mean, I think that's part of it, right? Does this become a reciprocal thing where we behave the same way as one another? Or do we cultivate, you know, another way of behaving? Kind of? And that's what, you know, so I think that effort in, the, in social media can allow for people to imagine a very different way of thinking about these things. Um, and in that sense, it can be, you know, a, a just one side of the solution. But in that sense, it's, a, it's just a, it's a tool for a deeper a deeper project that I think has to be articulated. Yeah. I just wanted to say that until until there are some rules and you know systems of governance, we need to be aware that that what we do, the actions that we do take, the clicks and the shares, the check-ins, they all affect the way that that mm -hmm. these platforms uh, take shape and move forward. So we need to be aware of what we do. Mm -hmm and how we do it, because this ecology is shaped around us. It's not random. Mm -hmm. That's a very wonderful final word. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please feel free to